Please join me in welcoming Sheikh Al-Walid Al-Thani, the CEO of Invest Qatar, also known as IPAC. Please come up. Thank you. So Sheikh Ali, you and IPAC and uh, other colleagues uh, there are on a mission to attract foreign direct investment, diversify the state's economy. Uh, I also wanted to say that Sheikh Ali and IPAC are also key stakeholders in another event that we do, the Qatar Economic Forum, which is powered by Bloomberg, taking place in Doha this May, May 14th and 16th. Uh, I don't think I'm bragging too much to say that uh, the Qataris and Bloomberg have created one of the preeminent global convenings um, around uh, important global uh, economic issues in QEF. So, uh, I am inviting all of you to join us, and we'll have a little bit more uh, details on that later. But thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, let's get started. You, you know, the current global trade discussions and debates um, are a very complicated uh, situation right now, uh, all throughout the world, in the Red Sea, as I think we've all been seeing. Um, and that, I think, highlights kind of the dynamic situation that we're in today. You know, deglobalization, reglobalization, nearshoring, it's highly dynamic and fluid. So I wanted to get your, your views first on those trends and what you're seeing uh, in the strategic position that the state occupies. And how should the Gulf and the state um, position themselves in this context? Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, great to see you again. And thank you. Thank you all for being here this early. Um, and also, I mean, I'll also join you in extending an invitation if anyone would wish to join the Qatar Economic Forum. The weather will be different in May and Doha. But, uh, you know. A little warmer. Yeah, we're all welcome to, to, to come, and, uh, and it's going to be an interesting discussion, I think, this year. Um, maybe back to the question. And I think, broadly speaking, if you look at the narrative of globalization, I mean, if you look at globalization itself, it's built on a narrative, right? There isn't right. one global system uh, that underpins it, multiple institutions, but these institutions have been, uh, I would say, uh, based on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a premise uh, that globalization, uh, seeking competitiveness, squeezing you know, every bit of efficiency, brings overall you know, net, a net welfare gain and and then governments would kind of uh, support those that fall through the cracks. And then this, I think broadly speaking, this narrative uh, has been uh, kind of breaking down recently. Yeah. Um, not in the sense that, you know, if you look at global trade, it's still increasing in overall figures, but I would say that more kind of regional, uh, intra-regional trade has been increasing at a faster pace. Mm. And maybe if you look at the, the GCC, as a block, um, it's a very, very fast-growing region. I mean, if you look at the IMF uh, projections of average uh, GDP growth within the region uh, is around 3.5%. Uh, the region is currently like 3.1 trillion in combined GDP, probably would reach around 6 trillion by, you know, in, in, a, in a few decades. Uh, uh, and that, uh, I mean, obviously uh, a number of opportunities exist. Um, the GCC economies are highly globalized economies in general. I mean, if you look at Qatar itself, our trade to GDP ratio increased from 90% to 100% this year. Uh, and obviously anything that happens, whether it's in the Americas, Europe, or China, directly impacts uh, uh, the Gulf. The Middle East sits between you know, Asia, Africa, and Europe. It's, traditionally and historically been a center for, for trade. Mm -hmm. uh, and so anything that happens really impacts us uh, and impacts, I think, everyone else uh, as well. Right. But uh, we're, we're seeing, I think, a greater, I mean, different trends emerging. If you look at the GCC uh, as a block, we're seeing greater integration within the GCC economies, a number of new initiatives like the GCC Rail Network, uh, the Customs Union, new free trade agreements, which opens up market access uh, for our businesses, uh, with recently with South Korea, uh, and, and kind of a, a broader pivot towards Asia when it comes to market access and, and economic integration. 
uh, we're, we're seeing the you know the the, uh, the India Europe corridor as right. well uh, emerging and and so that the region will still still play an integral role uh, in this kind of uh, new paradigm uh, right. we, we live in uh, and so you know and we we see value in that I think businesses are looking for platforms where they can engage in trade both east and west and and I would say that is the opportunity obviously there's most of our challenges are really exogenous, right? We're, we have obviously young populations, fast-growing populations. The region is attracting a lot of talent. Uh, I mean, if you look at Qatar as well, it's one of the most, uh, the most attractive destination for uh, intramina migration. Right. Uh, and, and that is something that we look to, to capitalize on in terms of attracting and, and retaining uh, talent. And also developing our own domestic talent throughput. I mean, a very early investment has been made in the educational infrastructure. Uh, we're seeing the throughput of, of STEM graduates mm -hmm. increase at a very fast pace. And so we're seeing a number of opportunities emerge uh, where businesses choose to relocate and base uh, in the GCC uh, and in Qatar or, or in, in neighboring economies and use that base to engage in multiple different regions uh, as it's a stable, secure, highly connected and, uh, and highly developed as well and is emerging as a place to, to live and work for, for families and for individuals. Well, you mentioned obviously both the GCC and, and, and Qatar. So how do you navigate, you and your position, um, navigate the, that path between, you know, you're part of the GCC, there is greater cooperation going on, that enables uh, greater um, uh, trade and business for the entire region. But then how do you separate out the state? How do you differentiate the state uh, from your fellow neighbors? Yep, I think generally when businesses look at Qatar or any of the GCC economies, they don't, I don't think they look at uh, these countries as kind of individual entities. They, they look at the bloc right. as a whole and probably the region as well. But I think each uh, jurisdiction kind of has its own comparative advantages. Uh, and, and these kind of comparative advantages could be around a national workforce or could be the ability to attract uh, and retain talent in each of these jurisdictions. Uh, it could be as well, as well around energy competitiveness and kind of uh, uh, a number of uh, determinants within that, that space. Uh, and as well as being part of different national initiatives because each country is kind of focusing on, on you know, s uh, some differentiated areas. And, uh, and so uh, I think this is kind of the main value proposition that businesses look for when, when they're choosing a, a, an area or a jurisdiction to base themselves in. Right. Yeah. Um, let's go back to some of the trends that you're seeing. Which industries and sectors do you think have significant um, trade upturns and downturns in the year ahead, do you think? And from a global as well as a regional and Qatari point of view? I think, in, in maybe uh, on, on a kind of Qatari angle, I mean, we've recently uh, launched our national development strategy. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at Qatar's kind of growth journey, um, you can kind of classify it in three main phases. The first may be around the development of the hydrocarbon industry, some primary sectors, national champions, whether it's you know, Qatar Airways, QMB, the largest bank in the Middle East, and, and other businesses that have been very fast growing. The second probably around infrastructure development, uh, maybe culminating in, in the hosting of the World Cup. And now this third phase towards you know, our, our 2030 uh, national vision, uh, which actually, you know, if you look at the national vision, is to create a, what we call a, a knowledge-based economy. Mm -hmm. and, and what that means really is an economy where the main uh, vehicle of growth is our own domestic human capital rather than our own natural resources. And that is kind of what we're aiming for. And within this strategy, we've identified a number of areas. 
including manufacturing. Uh, manufacturing obviously is a major part of our economy, but we're seeing a kind of a differentiated uh, value proposition there, both in terms of maybe Qatar is the most energy competitive uh, country in the GCC, but uh, our, the sustainability profile of our energy mix is very attractive, right. where it's currently around 80% gas with carbon sequestration at the source and 20% solar. Uh, solar is going to increase massively in, in terms of the share of our own power generation. That, I think, offers businesses a unique value proposition where they can benefit from competitiveness but have very attractive kind of carbon offset as well uh, uh, requirements uh, uh, with the kind of aim of going towards more carbon neutrality. Speak a little bit more, just if you yeah. would, about, about the solar energy plan. How soon, how, how does that scale up, do you see? Oh, that's scaling up very fast. I mean, uh, we had the first 880 megawatt solar plant, the uh, largest in the region, uh, open last year, uh, maybe slightly before the World Cup. Two new plants of equal size are currently being commissioned. Mm. And so solar will continue to play with gas right. a, a, as kind of uh, an, uh, an underlay. And, uh, but that will play a, a major role in our own domestic energy mix. Qatar is, uh, I mean, we have traditionally an overcapacity. We export within the GCC, uh, uh, not just energy, but even electricity. Right. Uh, and so now th that could be uh, as well a basis to grow our manufacturing base as well. But not just energy competitiveness, but there's you know, obviously the qualitative logistical advantages right. uh, and logistics is another area that we're looking at. Uh, hosting the second largest commercial air cargo fleet opens up a number of opportunities, whether it's on cold chain storage, freight forwarding, and e-commerce. Financial services uh, is on 14% of our GDP, but it's going to as well accelerate in growth. We're seeing areas like financial technology, Islamic banking, wealth management, mm -hmm. uh, main areas of growth. ICT, but ICT is not, we, we don't think technology is a sector, it operates across different sectors, but they're, they're very key enablers. And uh, in, in, if you look at our national kind of food security strategy where we've reached, I think, a, a significant level of, of self-sufficiency in, in food production, actually moving towards more exporting, exporting. and right. that as well uh, has been based on the adoption of uh, agri-tech in, in, in multiple different uh, clusters within the food sector. Uh, we're seeing go, uh, I mean, a number of areas, whether it's cloud as well, mm -hmm. energy competitiveness, uh, we're seeing an, a, a massive growth in, in the data center business, uh, and in other areas such as uh, AI. I mean, the, I think the demand for computing with AI will be growing very fast, with that demand, the energy requirements are going to increase substantially. Right. And, and, and this is, I think, where we fit in, right? We offer it not just at capacity, but also competitive and cleaner than, than multiple other jurisdictions, not just even in the GCC or the MENA region, but even in Europe and other areas. Right. And, and so this is kind of our, our, our positioning going forward. Uh, and moving towards 2030, where kind of the expectation, I mean, as I said broadly, young populations, the region is attracting talent, we're increasing our own domestic talent throughput, we're enabling them in terms of government regulations, policies, and incentives. I think if you look at the national development strategy as a whole, and you account for a number of the different initiatives that lie within it, um, it amounts over $100 billion, uh, and so, this is going to be a massive plan, and we're very excited uh, looking into the future. Well, thank you, uh, Sheikh Ali, for joining us. And, and like I mentioned, um, we will be hosting the Qatar Economic Forum May 14th through the 16th. And I'm happy to point out some of the confirmed speakers that we have here that you can see. Fred Smith from FedEx, Bruce Flatt, Brookfield, obviously, um, Ken Griffin. Uh, and we will be confirming more speakers as we uh, as we continue. So uh, if you have any questions about that, um, please go to the Qatar Economic Forum.com or ask any of us about that. 
Uh, and thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you.